Right, so now that we know a little bit about what no code is, let's talk a wee bit more about what no code can actually do. And as we mentioned before, it doesn't really matter if you call it no code or one word, or if you call it no code with a hyphen. Um, so broadly, no code is going to let you build apps, websites, software tools, and automations. And we'll talk a wee bit more about automations in a second. Um, but every no code tool out there has different capabilities and options. Um, but you're essentially generally able to create public websites that anyone can browse, private websites that people need to log into, mobile apps that people can download, um, and then private software that's accessible only to the people you want. For example, if you had an internal tool in a team uh, or something like that, you know, something that you only want if you select people to be able to use rather than something that anyone can come along and sign up for. Um, and then within all these different kind of options and these tools, you've got a ton of options, you know, you can work with databases, you can show dashboards, you can create booking systems, you can work with maps, you can create full social networks, e-commerce stores, you know, you can work with pretty much any third party tool out there, you can send money, receive money, probably even start a bank if you were really trying. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, the sky is really the limit here. Um, there's a lot of how-to videos out there that are going to show you how to you know, build stuff that feels like stuff that's out there today. But if you go through and if you really get the fundamentals and get a little bit of experience, you genuinely can build most ideas today uh, without code. And um, you know, as a result, whatever your idea is, it's very highly likely that you are going to be able to build it. Now, uh, the other thing that I mentioned there was automations. Let's talk a little bit more about what they are. Sometimes automations are, um, you know, part of an app. Other times they stand alone, but they're still considered no code. And, you know, really they're one of the, 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 the kind of best well-known, you know, most important parts of no code. The thing that no code tools are really, really good at that differentiates them from a lot of software, apart from the fact that they can make software, is that they're really good at connecting with each other. They're great at integrating with other tools. They're great at letting you connect to third parties. Um, and they're great at, at letting you use other people's services and data. Um, now, there's a tool called Zapier. You can see the uh, logo for Zapier right underneath the little picture of me. And uh, it's this incredible tool that lets you um, essentially connect tons of different services together, like... Google Calendar, PayPal, QuickBooks, I mean, literally anything you can think of, there's a very good chance that service is available on Zapier, and it will let you connect them together to do various different things um, entirely without writing any code. And so um, generally what happens is an automation is, you know, something gets triggered, something happens, some sort of event, uh, and as a result, one or more tasks are carried out. So let's say, for example, that um, somebody put some time into my calendar for a meeting. I could have a Zapier automation set up that would, you know, basically check my calendar for any time an event comes through. And then once that event comes through, it will, I could configure it to, let's say, it could email a confirmation email. It could send me an email to say, by the way, you've got a meeting at this time with this person. And it could even automatically take my Zoom link email it to the person so they've got it well in advance. Now this is just a really, you know, small example, but, um, you know, on the slide that I've mentioned a, a, a really pertinent example, imagine you ran a, a doctor's office or a GP as we call it in the UK, and, um, you know, you've got new patients signing up. Now, the way that tends to work in a doctor's office at the minute is you take a bit of paper, you fill it out, um, with all your kind of details, you give that to a receptionist and they take it, they deal with it, um, you know, and eventually you end up in a database and uh, registered with a doctor. If you are um, working with automations, then you could have someone take that sign up form, turn that into a digital document automatically um, by using a camera that can read it. Uh, you could then have an automation notice when that's been uploaded, take that data. Uh, you know, put it in the patient's database, um, send an email that notifies the doctor, send an email that, that notifies a patient, maybe schedule the first appointment for the patient to come in and get a checkup. You know, all these different um, little tasks that can happen are a result of automations. And we'll be exploring these in a ton of depth later on. We'll also have a bunch of other videos um, around about how you can use tools like Zapier and uh, some, of, uh, some of the other tools that can do this, like Integrama, NAN, all these kind of things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about who no code is for um, and what I mean by that is kind of you know who is able to use it 
and who is going to be best served by using it. So I think the, the first thing to say is that every no-code tool is a bit different. They all have a different level of, of learning curve. Um, they have different ways of explaining things. They have different ways of working. But primarily, the idea of a no-code tool is to be accessible to somebody who has no technical knowledge at all. Now, there's a little bit of a spectrum there because there's a difference between having no technical knowledge at all but being somebody who uses computers and the internet all day long, really understands them, maybe has friends who understand and can help them. You know, there's a difference between that and then being somebody who maybe doesn't use computers that much, you know, maybe hasn't had a lot of experience with the internet, hasn't used a ton of different apps, maybe just uses the same, you know, couple of apps uh, most of their life, you know, there's a huge difference there. And then there's also a difference between people who are non-technical and people who have somewhat of an understanding. So each no-code tool um, will, will cater to one of these audiences. Um, but the way I kind of view it, and as a bit of a general rule of thumb, if you can use Microsoft Office, if you can use a spreadsheet and do some basic stuff in that, you're going to be able to get to grips with no code, no problem. If you can't do that, uh, there's probably still a good chance that we can we can help you out. It's just maybe going to be a little bit more difficult. And if you are way ahead of Microsoft Office, then a lot of no code is going to come, you know, really intuitively to you, really useful. And if you have any experience in programming at all, the chances are not only can you get up to speed on no code really quickly because you're going to understand a lot of the underlying mechanisms, but also you're going to find you're a lot more productive with no code than you were with code itself. Um, and so, you know, no code is, is really accessible for individual people. You know, chances are uh, you might be a solo founder setting up a company for the first time. You might be a hobbyist working an app yourself. But if you are somebody who um, has a small business, has a team, maybe works in a large enterprise, you know, in some way or other, has customers to think about and, and data to protect and, you know, uptime to care about, then um, no-code tools are, are starting to really provide the kind of security and the robustness and the reliability that you need to run a large successful business on them. And that's going to become important as we go through no-code um, and as we start to look at the fundamentals because you're going to see very quickly that, yeah, you can build a nice small demo app here to show people, but actually, it is very possible and it has been done to take a no code app and scale it to, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of users too. Um, and so as a result of all that, you know, no code is used by uh, entrepreneurs of all ages and types, of all business sizes. It's used by employees from all kinds of industries. Um, it's used by tons of well-known brands and we'll get into what some of those are later on. Um, fundamentally, no code is, uh, is usable by anybody. And, uh, and hopefully you're going to get an idea of why that's true as we start to go through the different platforms. Um, so we've talked about what no code can do, why it's amazing. Let's just kind of get some bugbears out of the way at the minute. Now I've done a little bit of a table here around about what is possible with no code and what isn't possible with no code. And uh, the first thing you'll notice is every single line has some context and details. Uh, and the reason for that is a lot of things that are not possible with no code are actually possible but just really difficult, especially for a beginner. Or they're moving so fast that potentially by the time this video is published within a couple of months, uh, it will already be outdated. That's how fast the no code scene moves. And actually a lot of growth of the no code scene that's made um, most of the things we're going to talk about possible has only come in the last year or two. So we still have a ton of stuff to go in terms of no code and, and what's kind of coming down the line. So let's take a quick look. Um, in general, 3D modeling, video games, um, a augmented reality, virtual reality, that's quite difficult in no code today. If you remember from the ecosystem picture we looked at last time, there are definitely tools that do it, like Scapic and Buildbox, um, but it's still early days. You're not going to be quite creating the next Call of Duty without code just yet. But stay tuned. There's a good chance that's going to happen in the future. Uh, in terms of audio production and usage, Again, the line's a little bit fuzzy here. You know, could you build something like Spotify that plays music? Absolutely. You can store music, you can play it, um, you can work with it to some extent, but you're probably not going to be able to build a music production tool without code just yet. You know, you're going to really struggle to build something like Fruity Loops or Ableton if you've heard of those. Um, large volumes of data. Now, this is quite a kind of um, contentious part. When I say large volumes of data, um, you know, it's very difficult in no code today to find a tool that could work with, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes and terabytes. And actually, um, a lot of uh, 
um, different no code tools have limitations around about you know how much data can you upload how much data can you hold it's only going to be in very narrow specific use cases that this is going to be a problem for you and at the minute if i'm using phrases like terabytes and petabytes and you don't know what that is probably don't have to worry about it your use case probably doesn't have enough data for this to be a problem just yet um, the good news is there are a couple of tools that are really good for this there's a really cool tool called parabola um, we've got a few videos uh, on that tool elsewhere in the university but parabola is really great for um, taking massive sets of data uh, processing that data so chopping it changing it doing different things to it and then putting it somewhere um, on the other end so again i'm going to caveat large volumes of data it's pretty hard to do unless you really know what you're doing but tools like Parabola are going to make that really possible really quickly. Um, desktop and offline apps. So desktop apps have definitely become a little bit less popular uh, over the last few years. Typically what most people do if they're coding is they'll code a desktop app um, in a tool called Electron. And all Electron is is essentially you kind of take a web app and turn that into a desktop app. So for example, the software that I'm using to show these slides today, um, Pitch.com, it has a desktop app, but all the desktop app is doing is running the uh, the web app locally. Um, and so there are tools out there that can do that. Uh, to Desktop is a great example. And uh, these tools can kind of take a web app that you've built already and turn that into something that people can, can use on a desktop, like a program that they would install. Um, I've put it on this page because you can do it. It's not perfect. It's definitely not... Um, you know, native, deeply integrated, well supported, um, but it is possible if that's what you're trying to do. Um, hardware uh, slash the internet of things. Um, if you haven't heard the phrase internet of things before, you can think of it like home automation, you know, Philips Hue bulbs and stuff like that, Nest thermostats, you know, connected devices. Um, there are a few tools starting to come out in this space so far that will, will kind of let you start to program hardware and that kind of thing. But broadly, you can't do very much here. The good news is, um, based on the, the kind of automation stuff that we talked about earlier, there are a few no-code automation platforms. Zapier is one of them. And um, there's another one called If This Then That, or IFT, which is I-F triple T, as I spelled there. Um, and there's even Apple's very own uh, Shortcuts, I think it's called, where... You can interact with uh, connected devices, you can connect to them, you can trigger them, do different things on them. Um, so again, a lot of context, are you going to be able to create your own, uh, let's say, smart blinds or smart uh, lights without code? Probably not. Are you going to be able to control someone else's? Yeah, there's a good chance you maybe could do that. Um, the next one we'll come on to is highly secure use cases. Think about banking, healthcare, you know, the kind of stuff where if any of these data got out, you're probably going to get sued and you're going to be all over the newspaper. Um, in general, no-code apps are not great at this so far. And the reason for that is um, most no-code apps are hosted in the cloud. You're not fully controlling the code, nor are you controlling the data. And therefore, that's going to make a lot of regulators very, very twitchy. Um, there are some platforms like AppGyver, which will allow you to do this. Uh, Backendless is another good one because they they allow you to host your um, your no code software on your own servers and, and your own um, your own kind of infrastructure. And if you can do that, generally you've got a lot more control and regulators are less worried. Again, if all that starts to sound a little bit too technical, don't worry. Um, again, this is just really explaining the absolute limitations, and the closer you get to the limitations the more technical this becomes. And so we're going to stay pretty far away from that. Um, and then the last one's machine learning and AI. This is this is probably one that's worth a bit more of a debate because um, there are a bunch of tools out there that let you do it. Uh, there's NanoNets and there's one called uh, Leaf or Loom or something like that. It's not Loom because Loom's what I'm using to film this. Um, but there are, there are tools out there that will let you um, start to create machine learning models, um, artificial intelligence models, but they're still pretty far away from being uh, usable uh, if you don't already have the knowledge. If you already have enough knowledge to make use of these tools, then you're probably quite technical, um, maybe even more technical than you realise. Uh, if you are completely non-technical and trying to get into machine learning and AI, it's going to be more difficult. We can definitely have a chat about that on our office hours or on our community. Um, but right now, today as we speak, it's not the easiest thing to do. But, you know, with all of these things... Um, 
they, they they are getting easier, they're getting better, they're getting a lot more capable. Um, and if you find that you've got a use case that's in this last uh, this list of limitations and you're a little bit worried about that or you're a little bit disheartened, uh, don't be, reach out to me. Um, it is very, very rare that somebody asks me how to do something and I can't give them some sort of blueprint. I'm not saying it'll be easy. Um, I'm not saying everything you want to do will be possible, but I would be very surprised if we can't get you uh, to at least some sort of app uh, or, or otherwise help you realize some kind of idea. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of look at the, the use cases that are possible in a bit broader detail, um, these are all broad, broad topics, but but give you a kind of idea of some of the stuff that you can do. You know, you can build any kind of app. You know, you can build dating apps, social networking apps, delivery apps, marketplace apps where you've got people buying and selling. Um, people build, you know, software as a service type tools. People have memberships. Let's say you're, I don't know, let's say you're a fitness coach or a personal trainer or something like that. You want people to be able to sign up, get your content, you know, maybe have a call with you every week. All of that can be done without code. All of that can be put into an app. All of that can be automated. Um, you can even build e-commerce websites to buy and sell things. You can use no code to power a, say, a weekly newsletter that you want to write to people. Um, you can even build enterprise software. You know, you can build stuff that's really secure, really reliable, usable by hundreds of thousands of people within an organization um, and still complies to, to some security standards, as I mentioned in the last video. Um, it's not the easiest to, to build stuff for highly regulated environments, but it's a lot easier to build no-code software that is deployable within these environments as long as you're not building your own bank. But it has been done before, twice actually, as far as I can think of, and we've got a few of those examples on the website. Um, so we're going to wrap it up there, uh, jump into the next video and uh, we'll find out a little bit more. Thank you very much.